Good evening. I would like to share with you some new developments that we have recently. I think we have good news for you if you do lens surgery. I'm going to talk about the errors you have in, in IEL power calculation. And as you know, we have different sources of error. Now, just think about it. We have the measurement errors and we have the formulas errors. But also you have to realize that since the introduction of the laser barometry, 2000 I think it was, the IEL master came, and from then on we had a new scene because the accuracy with laser biometry is so incredibly high that you need to realize that if you have a standard deviation about 20 microns on the accurate length, this will translate into an error of the, in the refractive plane, the spectacle plane of the patient with less than a tenth of a diopter. But in my practice, not every patient is ending up within a tenth of a diopter. So we must have more errors in the game. So let us for a moment forget about the problems when we deal with the corneal power. And I, I won't talk about the post-laser cases, uh, although I, I love these cases also. But you have to realize that one of the major sources of error is actually how the IOL ends up in the eye. And Sam Maskett was alluding to the fact that we don't know this. Well, I'm going to tell you how we can actually predict that. And actually, the formulas vary precisely in this regard, how they actually do the ELP estimation from the two readings that they use for input, the K reading and the actual length. And from these two readings, they come up with some estimate on the ELP or the ACD post-op. But you have to realize this is a major source of error because the actual length error is so small. What we are talking about here is actually if you have the K reading, you have the actual length, from these two measures, you need to know where the IO ends up in the eye. And the concept of the uh, corneal height formula is really invented by Fyodorov in 1967. So this is nothing new. And I would say this formula was developed at a time with ultrasound and with iris clip lenses, so it's not necessarily useful for us today. And I would say we can do better. Because what I'm telling you is that if we measure the anterior segment structure, that is the anterior chamber depth and the length thickness, we can come up with a very nice correlation of the final position of the implant in that eye. And I will prove that because with the Hackstride lens down machine, you can actually measure the IO position with laser biometry. So it's very accurate. And if you do that on a regular basis, and you know that you can do that with the lens star, this is first shown for the phagic eye, and you know lens thickness can be uh, measured with high accuracy, but also the final position of the implant is actually coming up very nicely. And in this slide, you can also see you can actually measure the thickness of the IOL if you want. And from that on, you can measure the IOL power if you want. But for now, I would like to, to use that information where the IOL ends up in the eye after surgery. And we come up with a concept which is really simple concept. The C constant describes the position of the implant in the eye as a um, variable from the anterior chamber depth and lens thickness. You can see the formula down here. So it's a fraction of the lens thickness. You may say the crystal lens, what is the C constant of the crystal lens? It's 0.5, because 50% is exactly in the center. And the same constant applies to different IL types. And the normal fraction is about 0.4 or 0.5, it's within this region. If we do that in a series of cases, I would like to share, oh, what's happening? So the C constant is, in this case, shown for the Akrasov type of lens. You can see the C constant is about 0.4. And what is very important is that this constant is not changing over the actual length, meaning that we do not have a bias with the actual length. So we don't need the, the actual length in our predictions. And here you can see that it actually works. So if we take the anterior chamber depth, the lens section pre-op, use that, predict the post-op situation, we have a nice correlation about, correlation coefficient about 0.8 something. This is the highest correlation I've ever seen in any uh, series. 
Now, we, now, we now know where the physical position of that implant ends up in the eye. To go with that, we need a formula that takes this parameter in a useful manner. And there you cannot rely on thin lens formulas. You've got to use thick lens formulas, paraxial ray tracing or exact ray tracing. And I'm happy to have such a formula that can use the exact position of the implant. One of the other advantages of a thick lens approach is you can have the true net power of the cornea, not relying on the anterior surface in itself. And for this uh, show, I want to show how we compare our predictions with the SRKT in 1840 routine lens surgeries. We used the C constant, and we did all the measures that we usually do, the mean error, the mean absolute error, and so forth. And here you can see on the left side, um, when you do optimization, you're really sure that all your predictions on the average is ending up as a zero error on the mean but that's not necessarily the same as every case is zero because they have a spread around the mean. And here on the left side, you can see the blue columns is the SRKT and the red ones is our approach. And you can see they end up on the average as the same, but what is more interesting is spread around the mean. And another measure of the spread is to take the mean absolute error. And if you do that, on the right side, you can see that our approach is, is performing very well compared to the SRKT over the entire actual length, maybe especially in the long eyes. And if you compare some of the other formulas out there, we have the SRK1, and I don't recommend that formula for even my, my worst friend. Um, we have the SRK2, you have the SRKT, and the holiday, and our own approach. I was happy to see that our approach was performing very well, well over the entire action length. We still have some, you know, the short eyes is a challenge because you have all the measurement errors adding to a larger refractive error in these eyes. But the long eyes are doing pretty well. And another way of putting it, if you take the mean absolute L, you can see there's a stepwise increase in accuracy. If we go from the SRK1 to the SRK2, SRKT, and the holiday one, and then there's a 14% drop in mean absolute error with our approach. The last comment on this slide is a little tricky to explain because in this slide, I use the information from the fellow eye. So if I have the first eye coming up with a certain refractive error and I measure the anterior chamber depth, that is, I measure the IO position in that eye. I use this information for the second eye. Then I get even higher accuracy. So I would say we can do very much better than the SRKT, for instance, and we can do in, in this series the number of errors more than one diopter was reduced by 50%. You may say, why do we have the error with the SRKT? And I would say it's blind to the variation in the anterior segment. And to prove the case, here I have plotted the error with the SRKT against the anterior segment size, which is the ACD plus the length thickness. And you can see there's a significant correlation, meaning that this formula has a bias. Another way of putting it, you can see the grouping of the error is so that the span of the error, oh, I'm sorry, the span of the error is 0.6 diopters, from minus 0.3 to plus 0.3. 0.6 diopters error according to anterior segment size. So I would say all formulas taking only K and the actual length reading have a bias with the anterior segment size. And I don't want to speak about the post lasik case, but, but that's also very valid for these cases. Now, I was talking about the fellow eye, because the evidence of the fellow eye, you can actually use that in different ways. You can use the information from the first eye for your surgery of the next eye. But more important, you can actually use the information from both eyes to see how the performance of your formula is doing. Because if there's a correlation between the error from the right eye to the left eye, this means your formula is doing very poorly. So the formula is not seeing the variation within the subjects. And this holds for the SRK2. This is a bad formula. That's why I showed it on this slide. It's also present for the SRKT. 
because there's a collation. There shouldn't be a collation. And the reason for this is actually that the ACD, the position of the implant, has a very high correlation between the first eye and the second eye. So if you only knew the position of the implant of the first eye, you could actually plan for the second eye. What you can also do is you can, from this correlation, if you know the, the correlation or the regression, you can actually compensate for that when you do your own series with a bad formula. You can actually take the error from the first eye, use this error, correct your formula for the second eye, and you get better results. That's what's shown in this slide. All the yellow columns have been corrected by the post-op situation. Now, talking about the methods that we use when you do IO power calculation, you have different levels of ambition, I would say. You can use thin lens formulas, you can use thick lens formulas, you can also use ray, tra ray tracing. And to show that ray tracing is an option in, in, in our mm, field of IO power calculation, uh, we published this paper recently in the um, Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery to show that you can use ray tracing to analyze what is the power of the eye well within the eye from the biometry of that eye, from the refraction of that eye, and from the eye well position. <coughs> and ray tracing wasn't invented yesterday. It has been there for many hundred years. The advantage of ray tracing is actually you can ask a lot of questions. If you put ray tracing into commercial engineering software, you can ask for the IO power to be in that optic system. And you can analyze for the point spread function. You can get some information about the image quality. So it's a great advantage if we could do that in our clinical setting. But just for this, case, I would like to show that you can also calculate the IL power within the eye. And to show that it really <coughs> works, you can see we have the implanted IL power on the abscissae and the calculated IL power on the y-axis. And you can see from minus something IL power to plus almost 40. There's a very nice correlation going through origo. So meaning we can do this, it works. <coughs> so, I would like to share with you, why don't we use physical optics more often than we do? We don't have to play around with these thin lens formulas, fudging everything. And I hate A constants, because it's not telling the truth. I would like the concept to be truly anatomic in nature. I've tried to explain to you not only, I think it's better, but i try to explain why it's better. I thank you for your attention. I, I actually have a couple of questions that I'd like to uh, pose. Uh, first, I, I think it's about time that uh, somebody's looked at this, and, and I really applaud you for uh, finally looking at the things that we really need to know to compensate for what Sam called the original sin. Um, finding the lens position is, is truly a, a tremendous feat in these predictions. One of the things that makes me very curious is that as we age, obviously, our lens gets thicker. and I wonder whether you've looked at yet the data as to whether the formula behaves the same in a younger person compared to an older person, because one might presume that the degree of lens thickness increase might differ since the zonules don't attach right at the midpoint of the lens and the ultimate zonular plane that we have once the capsular bag is contracted uh, might not be the same for somebody with the, the thicker lens compared to the thinner lens. And, and is that an age-correlated issue? or strictly a thickness correlated issue? Of course, we have been into that. I found no correlation with age concerning the C constant. And think about it, because the length thickness, well, it increases with age, but at the same time, the ACD decreases. Meaning, in reality, the suspension of the crystalline lens is about the same over all the years. So, and we have, we have data from pediatric cases as well, and from 100 years old, and I, I was really amazed to see that the C constant was a true constant over the ages. I'm also going to ask you to speculate about something. And the speculation, now that you've got uh, these tremendous measures that we're receiving from in interference biometry and the formulas that you're able to predict with, 
are we going to soon bump up against the variability in the manufactured power of the implant lens within a particular lot? Oh yes, I think that could easily, that could easily be <coughs> the next frontier. Uh, we know nothing about what, e what is the tolerance of, of the implants that we use today. Uh, that was actually one of the reasons why we, we made this study uh, trying to calculate what is the I.O. power within the eye, given a certain eye. Then we have some diagnostic methods to, to deal with what is the actual power working in that eye. I published the beta, a, a paper more than 15 years ago where we actually had a refractive surprise caused by mislabeling of the I.O. more than five diopters. And at that time, we measured the I.O. power by extended keratometry if you measure the Purkinje images inside the eye, you can actually measure the curvature of the implant, and in that way you get the power of that implant. But another way to go is actually to do the biometry and back calculate what is the actual IL power within the eye. I was amazed at the accuracy and also because of the non-biased approach. But we don't know the answer. You know the... the, uh, the uh, FDA or the ISO requirements are very large, so you can actually have errors up to half a diopter, some diopter ranges, and it's still legal. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know the answer, but I think that could be very much the next step we want to claim or ask for the companies to give better lenses. Do we have any questions from the audience or the panel? Thomas, in, in that large series that you did, what was the, um, the error, um, the percentage of patients within half a diopter, which is sort of a benchmark that we use? Yeah, I don't recall that exactly, because you can, when you know the standard deviation, it's, in, it's a pure mathematic issue to, to do these numbers. But uh, actually, I had two series. This series is from the university uh, clinic setting that I'm working in, and I'm not very proud of the uh, total error that we had in this series. And, and I'm also working with a German group in a private clinic, and they have a very highly controlled environment. And in this group, we had even better results. So the mean absolute error was coming close to 0.3 diopters. And as you and I know, the mean absolute error translates into the standard deviation by a factor 0.8%. If you take the standard deviation and have 80% of that, you have the mean absolute error. And from that on, you can calculate within half a diopter, within one diopter. I would say 99.5 something was within one diopter. I don't recall the half diopter, but, but we're getting very close to the post LASIK or the post corneal refractive procedures uh, accuracy that we're seeing. And I would just tell the audience that we've been using the Olson formula in our practice for some time now side by side with the Holiday 2 formula and we've decided to use the Olson formula now for all of our cases. It's, it has the lowest error. So, so that's, that's actually we've made oh, that recent transition. <laughs> yeah. I think that deserves some applause. Oh.